in Canaanite tales, two mountains, Targitsi and Theramagi, support the sky and enclose the terrestrial ocean. W.F. Albright suggests that the term El Shaddai stems from a Semitic origin found at the Akkadian words Shadu, meaning mountain, and Shadau, translating as mountain dweller. This associates with one of the Amuru's names. Philo of Byblos also claims that Atlas was an Elohim, just as he's a Titan in the Greek text, aligning with El Shaddai's mountain god interpretation. Harriet Lutzky offers another viewpoint, linking Shaddai with the Hebrew word Sad, meaning breast. This suggests a connection with the Semitic goddess, posits the twin mountains as symbolic breasts of the earth. Dual mountain themes are recurrent in Canaanite lore, similar to Horeb and Sinai from the Bible. The religious beliefs of the Canaanites were shaped by their geographical location, nestled between Egypt and Mesopotamia. These neighboring regions significantly impacted Canaanite spirituality. For instance, during the role of the chariot riding Marianu in Egypt's Hyksos era, Baal began to be linked with the Egyptian deity Set, especially Set's Setaka form. From that point on, Baal's depictions included the crown of Lower Egypt in a distinct Egyptian posture. Likewise, deities like Atheret, later known as Asherah, and Anat started being illustrated with Egyptian wigs, reminiscent of Hathor or Isis. From another perspective, Jean Batero proposed that Yah of Ebla, potentially a precursor to Yam, god of the sea, was aligned with the Mesopotamian god Ea during the rule of the Akkadian Empire. The Canaanite faith in the Middle and Late Bronze Age showed evident influences from the Hurrians and Mitannites. The Hurrian goddess Hebat found devotees in Jerusalem, while Baal was often equated with the Hurrian storm deity Teshub and Hittite storm god Tarhunt. When compared to the neighboring eastern Arameans, the nature and roles of Canaanite gods seemed remarkably similar. Early Amorite invaders of Mesopotamia previously recognized deities like Baal Hadad and El. Phoenician sailors spread Canaanite religious beliefs to the west, leaving imprints on Greek mythology. This can be seen in the division of power among the Olympian gods Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades, reflecting Hittite, Canaanite, Syrian divisions among Baal, Yam, Mat, or Marduk, and Ninurta. Additionally, Hercules' labors echo the tales of the Tyrian Melkart, who was frequently likened to Heracles. If we bring our attention back to the Elephantine Jews living in Egypt in the 5th and 4th centuries BCE, we notice that Judaism at this time is still polytheistic. The majority of the Aramaic fragments show either Jove, Yahu, or Kunum as the major head of the pantheon. But some, like this Aramaic text, Carpentra Stella, says, Blessed is Taba, daughter of Tahapi, devotee of the god Osiris, she who to none did aught of evil, by whom no slander whatsoever was spoken. Before Osiris be thou blessed, before him take the gift of water. Be thou his worshipper, my fair one, and among his saints be thou complete. In the top part of the stele, the Egyptian god of the underworld Osiris sits on the throne, recognizable with his characteristic crook and flail. Behind him is a goddess dressed in a long skirt, it could be Isis or Mat. The table, a lady perhaps, the deceased stands with her arms raised, an adoration pose. In the lower image, the deceased is shown lying on a lion bed. The embalming god Anubis is shown, assisted by the falcon god Horus. The four canopic jugs with the entrails of the deceased are under the bed, 
with lids likely designed as heads of the four sons of Horus. Imsit, Hapi, Duamateth, Kebahesenuf. Nephthys kneels at the feet of the dead, and Isis is shown at the head. What happened? How is it that when we get to the time of Ptolemy II, and the creation of the Septuagint, that we all of a sudden had the monotheistic approach to theology from these Israelites? I think the answer to this question is very simple. The popular philosophy of any given time period is going to dramatically affect the theology of that period. For example, we see how much the Stoics and Epicureans influence the Middle Platonist, who in turn influence Christian theologians and church fathers of the second century. But what about the third century BCE? At the time when the Pentateuch was being put together, Platonism was on the rise, along with Aristotle's school of the Peripatetic and the skepticism of Pyrrho. These philosophers, with the resources of the great library of Alexandria, access to thinkers like Zoroaster, the Magian, Heraclitus, some of the earliest thinkers to exhibit monotheistic or skeptic tendencies against the dogmas and superstitions of the day. Initiation here into the ancient mysteries so honored among men mocks holiness. They raise their voices at stone idols as a man might argue with his doorpost. They have understood so little of the gods. Thales was the first master of the school of Athens. He was known for traveling to see the greatest minds of his day in Egypt and Babylon. He taught that water was the first principle, arche, in which life can spring from. Thales believed in an uncreated being who crafts phusis, nature which all things are from. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Notice how water is the first thing that is formed. This is in line with the philosophical thinking of Thales in the school of Athens. It is also possible the Egyptian sages or magi like Zoroaster believed in something similar. Herodotus describes Thales as a Phoenician by remote descent. When Thales died, Anaximander became the second master, who was said to be the teacher of Pythagoras, who brought these teachings to Italy. Anaximander is the earliest use of the word Epirion, or infinite, limitless, to designate the original first principle of the cosmos, uncreated, beginning of all things first philosopher to employ in philosophical context the term arche, which until then had meant beginning or origin. Anaximander called this something by the name Phusis or nature. Next after him was Anaximenes, third master of the school of Athens from the Milesian school, who was a material monist who sought to discover the arche, the beginning or origin, the one underlying basis of all things. Anaximenes also believed that air was divine. He identified air with the breath of life, and thus the soul as well as the air and the atmosphere. Only a single sentence-long quote by Anaximenes survives. Just as our soul, being air, holds us together, so pneuma and air encompass and guard the whole world. This is the first extent source to use the word pneuma, or breath. Genesis 2.7 says, The Lord God formed man from dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, the pneuma, and the man became a living being. Genesis lines up perfectly with the philosophy of the pre-Socratics. After Anaximenes, you get Heraclitus, who claims to announce an everlasting logos, or word, according to which all things are one. 
in some sense. Opposites are necessary for life, but they are unified in a system of balanced exchanges. The world itself consists of a law-like interchange of elements symbolized by fire. And Anaximenes is criticized by Parmenides, who starts the school of the Eleatics. He is called the father of logic. It is during this time that superstitions and dogmas are being challenged. Anaxagoras would be the next master of Athens, and his innovative theory of physical nature is encapsulated in the phrase, a portion of everything in everything. Its primary expression is found in the following difficult fragment. And since the portions of both the large and the small are equal in amount, in this way too all things would be in everything, nor can they be separate, but all things have a portion of everything. Since there cannot be a smallest, nothing can be separated or come to be by itself. But as in the beginning now, too, all things are together. But in all things there are many things, equal in amount, both in the larger and the smaller, of things being separated off. God is one is also a phrase that is attributed to him, who in response to the challenges imposed by the competing schools of Parmenides and Empedocles, is able to unify the leading theories of the day. Anaxagoras introduced the concept of the noose, or the cosmic mind, as an ordering force. And one of his students would be Archelaus, the next master of the school, who was also at this time a staunch skeptic and natural philosopher. He's the one who teaches Socrates, and Socrates is the teacher of Plato. Plato would be the one to unify the entire base of knowledge that Athens had been accumulating from the world for the past 200 years and bring them into his dialogues through the character of Socrates, who was his teacher. Plato wrote a dialogue called Timaeus, an exposition of cosmology in which the demiurge, the agent who takes the pre-existing materials of chaos, arranges them according to the models of eternal forms, produces all physical things of the world, including human bodies. The demiurge, or the craftsman if you want to say that, is sometimes thought of as the platonic personification of active reason. What is so striking about this is that the Demiurge is the craftsman of the universe, like Yahweh or Ptah or El in the Ugaritic text. He is the uncreated creator of the gods and humans alike. Plato's idea of the cosmos is identical to what is taught in Judeo-Christian cosmology in the time when the Pentateuch is put together. Plato like his predecessors, were challenging the dogmas and superstitions of his day. And he even sought to replace Homer and Hesiod, the two most famous poets of ancient Greece, where most religious ideas of the day are found in the stories about their gods. For instance, take Plato in Republic Book 3, through the mouth of Socrates says, there is another motive in purifying religion, which is to banish fear. For no man can be courageous who is afraid of death or who believes the tales which are repeated by the poets concerning the world below. They must be gently requested not to abuse hell or Hades. They may be reminded that their stories are both untrue and discouraging nor must they be angry if we expunge obnoxious passages such as the depressing words of Achilles. I would rather be serving man than rule over the dead. And the verses which tell of the squalid mansions, the senseless shadows, the fitting soul mourning over lost strength and youth, the soul with a gibber going beneath the earth like smoke or the souls of the suitors which flutter about like bats, the terrors and horrors of cockatus and Styx, ghosts and sapless shades, and the rest of their Tartarian nomenclature must vanish. Such tales 
may have their use, but they are not the proper food for soldiers, as little can we admit the sorrows and sympathies of the Homeric heroes, Achilles the son of Thetis, in tears, throwing ashes on his head or pacing up and down the seashore in distraction, or Priam, the cousin of the gods, crying aloud, rolling in the mire. A good man is not prostrated at the loss of children or fortune, neither is death terrible to him, and therefore lamentations over the dead should not be practiced by men of note, they should be the concern of inferior persons only, whether women or men. Still worse is the attribution of such weakness to the gods, as when the goddess say, alas, may travail, and the worst of all, when the king of heaven himself laments in the inability to save Hector, or sorrows over the impending doom of his dear Sarpedon. Such a character of God is not ridiculed by our young men, is likely to be imitated by them, nor should our citizens be given the excess laughter. Such violent delights are followed by violent reaction. The description in the Iliad of the gods shaking their sides at their clumsiness of Hephaestus will not be admitted by us. Certainly not. Plato is clearly not satisfied with the pagan religions of his day and wants to replace it with a more up-to-date or mature theology, with a perfect God who has no mistakes and is never depicted doing anything that can be looked at as weak. Plato says, Let us declare then for what caused nature, and this all was framed by him that framed it. He was good, and in none that is good can there arise jealousy of aught at any time. So being far aloof from this, he desired that all things should be as like unto himself as possible. This is that the most sovereign cause of nature in the universe, which we shall most surely be right in accepting from men of understanding. For God desiring that all things should be good, and that so far as this might be, there should be not evil, having received all that is visible, not in a state of rest, but moving without harmony or measure, brought it from its disorder into order, thinking that this was all in ways better than the other. And Plato continues, In the forming the universe, he created reason in soul and soul in body, that he might be the maker of a work that was by nature the most fair and perfect. In this way, then, we ought to affirm according to probable account that this universe is a living creature and very truth possessing soul and reason by the providence of God. Plato also rejected Athenian democracy in favor of a republic guided by a priesthood and a philosopher king whose laws were given by the gods and are the most ancient and holy. He rejected even things he once said were great before, such as the Dionysian mysteries of love and passion, which he now argues in his last work are empty pleasures. For instance, in his last work, On Laws, 636b, these common meals, for example, and these gymnasia, while they are at present beneficial to the states in many other respects, yet in the event of civil strife, they prove dangerous. And moreover, this institution, one of old standing, is thought to have corrupted the pleasures of love, which are natural not to men but also natural to beast. For this, your states are held primarily responsible, and along with them all others that are especially encouraged the use of the gymnasia. And whether one makes the observation in earnest or in jest, one certainly should not fail to observe that when male unites with female for the procreation, the pleasure experience is held to be due to nature. But contrary to nature, when male mates with male, or female with female, and that those first guilty of such enormities were impelled by their slavery to pleasure. And we all accuse the Cretans of 
concocting the story about Ganymede to justify unnatural pleasures. In case you didn't know, Ganymede was the boy lover of Zeus. When we look at this, in context to the story of Maccabees, you see the laws enacted and followed by none other than the Maccabee dynasty, who revolts against the Greek pagan king Antiochus IV for putting a gymnasium in Jerusalem, which they called an abomination. Looks like Judas Maccabees and Plato believe the same thing about gymnasiums. I also think there is clear ties to ancient Babylon, Assyrian, and Sumerian laws, stories woven in the text. These are in no doubt in my mind authentic and ancient Near Eastern texts that the Greeks inherit from the Jews. For example, Deuteronomy, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, is clearly an ancient law that we see present in Hammurabi's code. As Plato said in the Republic though, for people to respect the laws, they need to be the most ancient and given by the gods from the oldest times. But I also think there is no reason to believe that the philosophers and scribes of Alexandria, like Demetrius Philarium, did not have any oversight over what was written.